Good morning guys, thanks very much for joining me today. Uh, we're going to talk about the bung. Is it fly fishing? Well, that's for each individual really to look within themselves and decide whether it's for them or not. It's not a question that I'm here to answer. What I'm here to do is dispel the myth that you just stick a bung on your line, hoi it out there and your bass bag fills up with fish. That's just not the truth. So, without further ado, let's get into it. I hope uh, you are all keeping well. Malcolm, Chris, Kerry, Robert. Uh, I don't know why you boys get up at stupid o'clock to watch me slavering on. You must be off your heads. <laughs> anyway, the bung. Um, I was very much the same as a lot of the decriers of the method, so what do I mean by that? I just thought, oh, what's the point? It's float fishing. Until one of my friends, uh, and an absolutely sterling angler, he, he won the English National Championships way back in 2002, fishing this method. Now, you know, he was, he was pretty much slated for it, but he didn't fish it like anyone else would have fished the bung at that time and that's what makes it such a an interesting method of fishing so let's tie a fly i'm going to show you a fly that i like to suspend under the bung and as we go i'll discuss the pros and cons of fishing the bung or the indicator uh, sorry i keep forgetting it's a global audience and uh, americans and canadians are probably scratching their head going what what's a bung but uh, it's it's pretty much an indicator with a hook in it so um we'll take this this is my preferred bung actually what you see on the main screen here and uh and this is the very bung that was given to me by David Murray. And he's the, the, the angler that I was speaking about. Now, there's a very good reason it looks like this and it's shaped like this. And I'll come on to that a little bit later on in the stream. So, let's get a hook in the vise and I'll show you a fly that I really like to fish under the bung. And it might be not something that you're expecting. So... I don't know how well you can see that, pretty well I would think. Um, basically, it's, it's like a dial back and it's Al's dial back. Now, Al is a good friend of mine, Alan Ward. Now, he brought a fly from the Bristol Fly Fishers and uh, it was a red dial back and, and I played about with the colours and stuff and I came up with this version. Now, uh, I could tell you uh, quite an entertaining story. Well, entertaining for me it was, but I fished an international at Rutland Water and Vince Brooks, uh, quite a famous angler here in England, was my boatman and I was fishing with a Scottish national champion who that year was Paul Sharp and uh, I fished three of these flies under the bung and uh, let's just face, he was, cry he was crying into his dram that night, let's put it that way. So, let's get on with tying it. If you've got any questions, guys, uh, I'll come to it after I've finished tying the fly, if that's okay. Uh, and I think it's going to be it's going to be quite a busy chat, so trying to do all the press all the buttons and do all the uh, do all the tying is going to be quite difficult. But I really appreciate you bearing with me. So the hook I've put in the vise is a Hanak competition. It's a an H230 barbless hook. This one's at size 12 and it's on a medium wire. The thread I'm going to be using for this fly is just uni thread and it's yellow. Now, although it's yellow, it does come up when it goes into the water, it comes up a really nice shade of olive. And uh, I think that's what makes it so effective. So what I've done is I've only put a little bit of wax just onto the tail end of my thread here because the thread's actually going to be the uh, body colour. I'll just put the binos on and I'm going to catch in quite well back for the eye actually. It's going to have quite a big head but there's going to be quite a lot going on at the front. So I'm going to use my rat's tail here just to help me get touching turns down the shank of the hook. Now, dial backs may not seem like an appropriate fly to hang under a bung, but 
people hang much worse things under the bungs. Uh, Steve Cullen posted on Facebook just before I came on live actually about make sure you include the chamois and you know the, the grub worm and the horror mitten and whatever but uh, I'm not going to do that I'm going to tie flies that I actually fish under the bung. So for the tail of this fly I've got a cock feather here and basically I'm going to take a few strands maybe a dozen bring them out at a 45 degree angle for the stem and then just rip them away. Just put that to the side. Now I want my tail to protrude about the length of the, the body. So catch that in, like so. Just loose turns, just so it's in place. Just check the length of the tail. Uh, the rib I'm going to be using is some of this Danville's. It's a fine gold rib. I've got a little bit off here. And I'm just going to catch that in. So, I was thinking about doing this video for a while actually and, and, and what put me off was I know it's controversial, I know people think it's not fly fishing and uh, I respect their opinions, you know, everyone's entitled to have their opinion about different methods but for me, uh, as a once competition angler, I think you've got to utilise everything that is available in your armoury to catch fish uh, quickly or you're letting your team down and you're letting yourself down so uh, I've got no dramas with fishing the bung or the indicator so next I'm going to add uh, a strip peacock herald here and I'll just take that away now what I've also got in this video lined up is after I've finished tying this fly what we'll do is have a look at a little slide pack I've produced and what that will cover is the pros and cons of fishing the bung and then I'll probably tie another fly and then after that we'll have a look at various leader setups for tying the bung and discuss the method that Dave Murray used to such great effect in the English National. So I brought my thread all the way back up. Now if you're of a mind to you can fatten up the body with more thread wraps, it's up to you. I like mine really thin for this pattern. And now I've brought my thread to the front, I'm just going to get several wraps in at the eye because I'm going to use the rotary function to bring my stripped herald down. I'm kind of pleased I can't see the comments at the minute actually, I don't want people um, <laughs> baying for my blood looking up my address on the internet to come and tell me that I'm not an angler. <laughs> hey. I don't know, I, you know, I really don't know why people get their knickers in such a twist about fishing indicators and bungs. Uh, it's, to me it's a bit like Brexit, you know, I wasn't bothered one way or another, I voted out but I might as I'd have been very happy to stay, uh, you know, there was pros and cons. And it's the same as uh, any sort of fishing method, really. You know, it, there's pros and cons. But I don't see this any different from fishing dry fly, fishing straight line buzzers. It's just another method, another string to your bow, if you like. So I've secured that hurdle in place. And let's see if I can just twist it away with my hackle pliers and that's a good one. Now you can um, use a layer of super glue before you bring the herl over but I like to use uh, wire on this particular pattern uh, just this is the way I've always tied it uh, which is unusual because often I tinker a lot with my fly patterns but this one because it's it's done so well for me I uh, I tend to just tie it exactly the same as I always have. So a couple of turns to lock that into place, then I can twist my wire off. Now I'm going to put jungle cock eyes on this and I've got a little feather here that I've half prepared and what I mean by half prepared, if I just touch that slightly, you'll see I put a little slit into the jungle cock and I think uh, those that know me know how tight I am. I don't use two feathers, I just uh, split the feather and use uh, the one feather for one fly. So I'm just going to help that split on its way. 
bring my thread around just check that it's sitting where I want it and once I've got it into position I'm going to tilt back the waist piece get a few turns in front of it let's just check your side that's looking pretty good then I can come in with my snips and just remove the waist and then I can pick my uh, cock hackle back up and I'm going to pull out about the same amount I used for the tail just pull it out at 90 degree angle for the stock and rip it away now I want about the length of the body as my beard so I'm going to dress that up and as it happens it's just about perfect get a couple of turns in and then I can mess about with position I can just grab that, I've not clamped down on it real hard which allows me to move it around underneath the fly I'm just going to bring my thread to the very back of the head because when I come in with the snips I don't want to snip my beard away uh, or cut my thread for that matter <laughs> especially live it looks a bit <laughs> you know you look completely incompetent so I'm just going to tidy up the head now catching in them cut ends and I'm going to build it up a little A nice big head on this fly. Now because of its super thin profile it does tend to get down fairly quickly. Much quicker than you would think actually for a fly of this size with no added weight. But uh, you've got to remember that in the IFFA rules you're not allowed to have added weight on your flies. And this is primarily for competition, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work in, uh, you know, your normal still water fishing scenarios. So I'll just touch a little bit of resin onto the head. I'm not going to be too fussy with it today. And then I'll give it a zap. Just a wee fibre there, it's getting on my nerves, I'll need to trim that or I'll no sleep at night. There we go. And that's uh, the wee dial back. Is, uh, and I know I've used yellow thread there, but in the water it actually does look like an olive fly. Um, so that's that. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a swig of coffee before I look at the screen. Uh, it doesn't look too bad. <laughs> what do you think of the Fario bungs? I've seen, I've, Dave, I've, I've seen the Fario bungs and they look excellent, um, great quality, but they don't resemble any sort of fly. They're, they're just a, a flotation device, basically, but um, definitely worth using if you're just going to your local still water or I think they're competition legal, actually, because they have a hook in them, but some people may argue that it doesn't represent a fly, so they shouldn't be legal, but, you know, you'll get people arguing black and white about the bung. I'm not not prepared to go down that road. I, I like them. I like the Fario bungs. Robert, yep, you're absolutely right. It's um, it's what, what conditions suit what methods you're fishing. You know, so if the bung's catching fish quicker than uh, straight line buzzer fishing, I don't know why you wouldn't use it, but um, that's maybe just me but sometimes it feels it is just me. Hi Chris, we are wanting more young folks to start fly fishing, tying we have to stop being snobby about fly fishing. Chris, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know what, uh, I was going to save this for a bit later, but I, I made the Facebook post saying that I was going to make this video and uh, a chap, many of you will know him, his name's Hugh Morgan and he's a professional fly fishing guide and uh, he made a post and he'd done a video on bung fishing and he got an email from a chap in America who'd uh, had a disability, hadn't fished for years and then 
you know, because he'd watched this video fishing the bung, he was then back to fishing, and and Hugh said it made him cry, and I can understand that. You know, he's he's helped somebody that loved fly fishing, could no longer do it for one reason or another, but then got into it. So, bringing on new people, getting people that are maybe not able to to fish conventional means fishing, I think it's a great thing. Why I don't understand people that say, oh, it's and and I think there is an element of snobbery. To it, but that's that's just how it is in the fly fishing world unfortunately. The bung is a weird method that I hate using but I do use when I haven't caught at all. It is so effective. It, 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 again, it, it can be really effective on its day. It, you've just got to, it's like anything else, you know if I could equate it to a war, you, you wouldn't go and fight cavalry with infantry, you would get your artillery out or a machine gun. You know what I mean, it just depends on the day. Morning Carl, how are you? Um, Robert, I'm using, it's called the Alone Fire. Uh, I'll just hold that up there. And, that, and um, somebody sent it to me actually. Uh, I was having some problems with the pen I was using and it was sent by, the name will come to me in a minute. No, it won't. I'm just old, I can't remember what happened yesterday. But uh, somebody kindly sent it to me. It's uh, got rechargeable batteries and it, it seems to be working great. Thank you. Hi Paul, I want to get into fly tying. Are there any kits you'd recommend circa 50 quid? Paul, let me have a look into that. That might be a, a, a future video. <laughs> the bung is probably always the best method. No, you've got to trust me, it's not always the best method. It's just a method. Nigel, that's true, but on rivers, it, it, they tend to call it duo or, or trio for that matter, and uh, it's not generally something that's, uh, where is it, it, it's certainly not something that looks like this, um, or, well, except uh, at the International Greeland Festival, and then it's very much something that looks like this, but uh, that's a different matter. It's generally a, a dry fly, a sedge pattern or a, a parachute pattern and, and people suspend a small nymph and uh, that seems to be perfectly acceptable but obviously uh, on the still waters uh, it's a very controversial method. Now before we go on I'm going to, I'm going to start the slide pack and just talk about the pros and cons. Okay, like any method there's pros and cons. Now it, you know, dry fly, the pro is that the flies are sitting in the surface and if the fish are feeding in the top four or five feet of water, you've got a very good chance of getting them. So what are the advantages to fishing the bung? Well, one of the advantages is you can present a fly accurately at a predetermined depth. So if the fish are cruising around three feet and you suspend your taking fly three feet from the bung, then there's a very good chance you're going to get it. Of course, with advantages there comes disadvantages and uh, one of the disadvantages is opportunity to vary the depth is limited but it's not restricted to just that depth. So I'm just going to pause this for a second. If you pull your line and your bung moves, the fly underneath it is obviously going to rise in the water and then once you stop that fly is then going to flutter back down in the water and that can be really attractive to trout uh, and is often deadly. Uh, let's have a look. Number two, indication is visual. So you see the take before you feel it. Now I don't know how many of you have kept tropical fish or freshwater fish but the speed which a fish takes something into its mouth and expels it is breathtaking to watch. It is so fast. Now very often they can do it without having any feel on the fly line but it's very rare that you won't get some visual indication if you're using a bung or an indicator uh, and the disadvantage is you can find that you're going cross-eyed watching the thing all day looking for just even the slightest bit of lateral movement a dip anything like that I mean don't get me wrong sometimes the takes are just breathtaking but sometimes very subtle as well once you have straightened your leader, you get instant bite detection on the drop. So again, once you've cast your flies, if you've got good turnover with your cast, you'll get what's called on the drop. 
So you're watching your indicator as the flies descend through the depths. And I usually count, depending on what flies I've got on a course, I usually count down between 10 and 15 seconds, really concentrating hard on the bung. And if it does anything other than float on the surface, I give it a little line strike because that often means you've got a fish taking your fly on the bung. Now, I've seen some pretty poorly designed bungs and uh, what happens with them is they twist up your leader and it becomes a nightmare, especially if you're fishing a bung with three flies underneath it. And uh, the last thing you want is uh, a big twisted up leader. Now, fish, fishing at short range means you can often play fish quickly into the net. Now, that, that's, uh, so my background, for those that don't know, is mostly lock style competition fishing. And uh, it's extremely important to be very quick and efficient when you're hooking and landing fish. Now with the bung, very often you're hooking them not, not 20 feet from the boat. And if you're really quick, you can get them in the net before they wake up and uh, take up half your day fighting them. So uh, that's, that's another advantage to fishing the bung. Now, the disadvantage of course, you nearly always have to be able to see the indicator, except for one method, and I'm going to share that with you. Dave Murray, so I was the same as, I was the a bung naysayer, I wouldn't fish the bung, it's float fishing. I get in the boat with Dave Murray, and he's going, oh, I'm going to fish the bung. I'm like, I don't fish the bung. And what he did was he put a bung on and he launched a thing. I said, what are you doing? He said, no, no, you've got the way I fish the bung. You've got a cast to the horizon. And then I said, well, you can't see the bung. You've cast that far. But it doesn't matter because what he then proceeded to do was a very fast figure of eight. Now, what this did was it brought the big wake that you often get with it when you're fishing a booby on the surface and fish would come to investigate the wake and they were absolutely smashing the flies in behind and then every now and again he would stop so when his bung was in sight he would stop retrieving and he'd watch the bung and as the flies descended through the water column he would get he would get a fish and it was an absolutely devastating technique and from that day i was a convert it was just efficient and really, really worth learning to do. Now, the advantages and disadvantages, that's all I can think of. If you think of any others, please put them in the comments of this video and I'll have a look at them later. Right, I hope that was of some use, guys. Let me just get the chat page back up and see if there's any questions on that. I very much doubt Martin's online. I don't think he's a, a big fan of the a fan of the um, the method. Um, Jane, I, I'm not sure about the rest of the world. I, I don't know if it's just inherently a British thing where people get their knickers in a twist about the bung or the the indicator. I, I'd, I'd love to know what you know what's people's opinions in America and Canada and uh, the 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 greater part of Europe. It'd be interesting to know what people think. Using the bung in the last year, it definitely has its day. I prefer using naturals, things like eggs, <laughs> but it can be so effective. I love the fish pimps one. Um, well, I'm going to have a look at um, alternatives, Robert, because um, a lot, of, certainly a lot of the still water fisheries that I fish, you're only allowed to fish one fly. So if I was fishing this kind of pattern, then I would obviously be breaking the rules. So uh, I've got alternatives to um, be able to stay within the rules of the fisheries. Yep, the adjustable bungs are, are good. Dave, I'm going to come on to that. Minus 10. Yeah, I think the coldest I've ever fished, Kerry, has been about minus 15. And that was an England qualifier at Wherewell. It wasn't a great day, I've got to say. You'd wondered where G-Boy had gone. I, I thought you'd snagged that when you went past it on your sailboard, Rob. <laughs> Um, Paul, I've actually caught fish on my bung and um, to be honest, when they come and take it, they take it quite deep. They just come up and take it right off the surface. But um, no, not, not really. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, it's not really, it's a sacrificial fly more than a, a, a taking fly. Okay, let's um, get on and we'll tie another fly. 
Now, this one is again very, very simple. And I'll just put it in the vise so you can see. And it's basically a black dial back with jungle cut cheeks. Now, uh, there's a wee bit of story, well, there's a wee bit of story behind all my flies, to be perfectly honest. I've picked them up over the years for various guys. And uh, this one came from an angler called Andy Everett. And uh, a phenomenal little fisherman. I say little, he's only short, bless him. But uh, he, he's a great angler and he loved fishing these flies. Now, to me, this is a dial back. To Andy Everett, he calls it his buzzer, and uh, which can be quite confusing if you're in a team on the water, and Andy's pulling them out, and you're going, Andy, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm on the buzzers. Uh, yeah, anyway, let's get it tied. So, again, I'm going to use the same hook. It's the Hanak H230, barbless in size 12. Just make sure it's in the vise. And... I'm going to be using some uh, Sempify Nano Silk. Now, usually I would uh, touch it with super glue, but unfortunately, I have left my super glue somewhere and cannot find it. So, uh, that's the trouble when your office has been moved to your dining room. Kids have probably got it in the room gluing shit to their walls. Anyway, where's my goggles? Okay. So I've, I've put some wax, wax on this nano silk. It's not ideal. Uh, as I've said in many of my pre-recorded videos, with the nano silks, the wax doesn't really cut it as a as a as a way of stopping body rotation. So I've got a bit of wax on there. I've run it back to approximately where a barb would be on a hook, and. I'm going to use some cock pheasant for the tail, very similar to the last fly we've just tied there. Pull it out, 90 degree angle, just put it to the side. And then I want the tail approximately the length of the body. So I'll lay that on, a couple of wraps just to get that into place. And I want to just remove a little bit of that. Now the rib, fairly straightforward, that's some fish on uh, 0.14 I think the diameter of the wire is and it's silver. And I'm going to catch that in on my side and it's going to be the entire length of the body. Now with the nano silk you can get quite a lot of wraps in without getting the bulk into the body. Now for the, uh, the body of the fly I'm just using some peacock herald. It's been dyed black. I'm going to take the brittle end of, off because that's what's likely to snap. And then I can get that into place. Now I could, uh, if I was of a mind to use the rotary function of the vise, but just for a change of pace, I'll just use hand over hand. I know a lot of guys don't have um, rotary function vices. They tend to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, and if you can get by with what you've got, why wouldn't you? So I brought that all the way to the eye. I'm going to get two or three turns to hold it into place. Pull everything back out of the way. And then, if you take it one at a time, they'll just snap away for you. Then I'm going to bring my rib. Over, try and keep your turn as uniform as you can. And then lock your wire into place. Now, again, this fly has some jungle cock eyes and I've got a feather prepared. Nearly prepared, should I say. Just the one feather. Again, I'm going to split it. A few 
few turns to hold it into place just check your side it looks okay I'll get my thread in front come in with my snips and remove that end now a few more fibers from the cock hackle And I want that, again, the length of the body. A few turns just to get it into place. Then I can manipulate it around. Get my thread to the back of the head. Come in with my snips and remove my waist. Now, when Andy was uh, obviously later that night, <laughs> we were in the bar, I'm going, Jesus Andy, this is a dial back, it's no a buzzer. Uh, it, when he showed me it, it didn't look like uh, the fly I've got in the vice at the minute, and the reason it didn't look like that is because Andy does something to his fly once he has it tied and I'm going to show you this now I don't think I've showed you this in any of the videos before but he uses um, like a rubber and, and all he does is just trim off some of the dial back fluff just making it that little bit slicker it looks a little bit messy maybe not as attractive and then you would simply varnish the head and you've got the finished article and uh, very often I'll fish a combination of uh, these two sort of styles of dial back under the bung and uh, fish it in the manner that Dave Murray would so that's the, uh, the second fly I'll just leave that in the vise for now, let's have a look see if there's any questions Bung fishing is like fishing streamers on the river, both deadly on their day, but frowned upon and banned by some waters. Uh, yes, Nigel, certainly the rivers in this country, but, you know, if you go to Europe fishing, it's just um, seen as just another way of fishing. It's, it's, it's generally not an issue. And, and I believe America's, Canada's the same, you know, it's just another way of fishing. Yep, I had, I had some really good times in the competitions uh, JN, it, it, it was a good time. It, it's the scene's changed a lot, but it's still there. It's still there. Uh, hi Tim, how are you? Nice to see you on, pal. Not been lynched yet, mate. I'd, I'd, I've not heard the bung police banging down the door. My Labrador's in the cord. They're ready to have them. <laughs> Why not use your UV resin instead of misplaced super glue? Yeah, that was a good suggestion, Brian, but I've tied the fly now. <laughs> uh, tried airlock, I think it's too big and too light to cast, and there's a, a ball shape. I've seen the airlock ones, Malcolm, um, it, it's not for me, I, I, um, I just like the one I have, and, and the reason is, so, as I was saying, you imagine Dave's cast his... Um, he flies all the way to the horizon. Now as that's coming through the water, you can see the shape of it, it's, it's going to make quite a disturbance in the water. And, and also because the, sh the, sh the shape it is, it's easy to cast. It casts easy and it, it makes a wake in the water. Uh, you know, if I stop, stop retrieving it, you can see I'm a good distance away as well. So I don't really buy them. I, I like to make my own. Uh, it feels like I'm still fly fishing. Indicators are good in choppy conditions. Yep, Philip, that's an, another thing. A lot of people say, oh, it's got to be calm to fish the indicators, but you imagine when um, there's a big chop on the reservoir, or even a small fishery for that matter, the bung's doing this. So below the surface, your flies are doing this, and that can be really attractive to trout as well. Have you ever tried float tubing using the bung? Um, David, I can barely get in the bath at the minute, my back's killing me, but I do want to give float tubing a go at some point, uh, maybe this year. 
Uh, I think they do do it at Chigborough Fisheries, so I might get down and maybe Tim will give me a cabbie on the old float fishing. Jim, yep, I, I think a lot of boys do tie their own, but uh, the Fario bungs are really popular for the comp guys. There was another method that um, I think it came about from Buell Reservoir where it was called the Tash. And instead of a bung, what you did is at your braided loop, you tied in some strike yarn and um, you would cast out your team of buzzers and you'd watch the end of your fly line with the strike yarn. And if it moved slightly, you could catch a fish. And the advantage of that over the bung was that when you pulled your line in to retrieve the fish, if you were fishing a leader of 22 foot, for example, your strike yarn would just come straight through the eyes of your hook and um, you wouldn't have any issues. Whereas when you're fishing the bung, you know, the maximum really you can have your bung set is probably 12 feet. But um, there we go. Carl, I'll take you up on that, mate. I really want to give the old float tubing a go once my back's back healed. <laughs> right, I'm going to um, flick to my other screen now and we're going to have a look at leader setups. Okay, leader setups for the bung. Now, I... Um, I predominantly fish large still waters, but in recent years I have started to fish more on smaller still waters. And the dilemma will always be New Zealand style, which is where you connect your line to the bend of the hook or on a dropper. Now the first image that's floating up there for you is um, probably a pretty standard competition bung setup. So. From the fly line you would have maybe one or two feet, some people have it even shorter than that to the fly line. Now your bung or your indicator has got to be as close to your main line as possible. It's all about contact. So I generally tie mine to about two inches and I can cope with that if I'm fishing it on a dropper. I'll very often fish this size of leader um, with the flies tied to the bend of the hook. So from there, three, three and three, so the, the maximum length uh, or depth you're going to reach is 9 feet, allegedly. Now, when you pull your flies or pull your line through the water, I think you're probably bringing your flies up in the water to maybe 5 to 6 feet. And that's where uh, the Murray style of fish in it. So when you're retrieving constantly with a figure of 8, your flies are getting no deeper than 4 to 5 feet. So I think a lot of the time, certainly back in the day when Dave was fishing it, people would look at Dave and say, he's fishing the bung, they must be at about 9 or 10 feet. But actually, they were maybe 1 or 2 feet deep in the water, and Dave was just bringing them in with a bung, and then they were slamming the flies in behind. So uh, that's, that's the first standard setup, and that's a sort of setup that I have in my comp box all the time, ready made, ready to go. Now, the next setup, I'll have early season. So in the spring, just after winter, and I'll, the fish generally are sitting a little bit deeper in the water column. Now, I'm talking about large reservoirs for this setup. You know, most of the small waters that you go to, you'll be lucky if they get to 12 foot deep. But for this, for this setup, from a boat, this is the kind of setup I would have. And generally, although I've put dial backs, onto this image, I would be fishing heavyweight buzzers because I'm trying to get to the depth quick. Now, this might seem very obvious, the next one, when it comes up. So I've got um, a bit more distance between my floating line and my first fly. And what I've done is I've, um, I've added the indicator on the end. Now, some people would say, that this is uh, the washing line. Now, if I put a booby on the end, if you're fishing with fluorocarbon and heavier flies, a booby will get dragged down. This indicator, and uh, you've seen the one I had in the vise, that doesn't get dragged down, that'll stay on the surface. So when the fish are in that top couple of feet of water, this is an option for me. And then, as I was saying before, some of the small fisheries that I have started to frequent, it's one fly only. So what I use is one of these sliding indicators and they're from uh, Frog Hair. They're, they're easy on and I'll show you them in a minute when I uh, come back off the screen. I hope that uh, makes sense. 
If you are on a small fishery that only allows you to fish one fly, then you would obviously gauge the depth that you want to fish at and be able to fish. And this is one of the, the beauties of this, which we'll come on to in a second. Right, so these are the, the frog hair ones. Uh, I'll, I'll show you one close up on this camera. And as you can see, it's like a rugby ball shape. And all you do is you slip your, your leader into the little hole here, pull it off, and then you can adjust it up and down the, the length to, to whatever depth you want. And uh, th these are really good. Uh, I when I first went to when I first learned to river fish, actually uh, went to Slovenia. The guide pretty much put me on these um, because I was handless. But um, <laughs> yeah, great great bits of kits, and I still use them today for the still waters. But they're not cheap, but. I don't use them often. As, as I say, I'll fish the bung when it's appropriate, not all the time. Uh, there is other ways of catching fish. Y you know, we all know that. Your sunk float tube, Jim. I hope you weren't in it when it sunk. <laughs> Morning, Dale. Right, so uh, we'll tie one more fly uh, before I go. And something that is uh, extremely effective under the bung is a blob. Yep, I can already hear the gasps of horror at the other end of the camera. Now, uh, this was brought to my attention by uh, an angler called Mark Miles, and we, we fish a friendly little competition on Manningford trout fishery every January, and uh, unfortunately it didn't go ahead this year, obviously, as nothing much went ahead this year. But, my, I, I, for some reason, I've ended up next to Mark Miles for the last couple of years, and uh, you know, every year I look on in awe as he's ripping fish out the water, and I'm struggling to stay with him. And and eventually, he shared his secret with me. He's he's fishing an orange blob about four foot under an indicator, and I said, but. So I said, I've got an orange blob, got my orange blob out, tied it on, threw it out, and my orange blob floated on top of the surface right beside my bung and I thought oh this isn't working and afterwards when we're in the lodge having a bit of a laugh I said to Mark I said how do you get the thing to sink he goes oh, I've got I've got a bead under the dressing and I thought oh, okay so uh, I don't know if you can see it on this one I've already tied but hidden in the dressing here is a bead and uh, I'm going to show you how I've put this together if I can find a bit there we go Right, let's get the binos on. Now, there is another way of doing it, of course. Um, you know, you don't have to use a tungsten bead like I've got here. You can use some ad adhesive lead foil. Uh, I'm not keen on it. I don't, I don't think it's heavy enough, to be honest, especially with the, um, with the frits. I'll just have a drink of this water. Because what I want to do with the rest of it is I've got my frits here, and I just want to soak it. And remember not to drink that after. Don't know what's in this fritz. So I like to um, damp down my fritz before I use it. And the thread I'm going to be using is some uh, Vivas. This is the uh, 30 denier. As you can see, it's a white thread. And I don't want my bead at the front of the hook. So again, I forgot my super glue. But as suggested, I'm going to just dab it with a little bit of UV resin. I want a fairly long tail and I'm going to catch that in not too fussily up and down the shank yeah I can just cure that off should have thought of that myself well done whoever that was now what I'm going to do now is bring my bead up just past the middle of the hook towards the back I'm going to bring my thread. Now I'm using my rat's tail here to control my thread. Now once I've got that into position I'm going to just come over the bead a few times just to lock it into place in a figure of eight motion. Now the reason I have the bead here near the back is I want it to sink bend down. So I've cut that in, removed my waist and then with my damped 
down frets. I should have removed some of the, the fibre from the core. I can do that now, though. I'm going to catch that in. Like so. And then bring my thread to the front of the fly. And then I can simply get a couple of turns in before the bead. Maybe squeeze another one in there nice and tight. Bring it back. And then continue up the shank. And uh, out of all the flies, for the big still waters, I've, I've not done this, but on small still waters, uh, this is absolutely lethal. I had a, a phenomenal day on the Albury Estates last year uh, when it was absolutely baking hot and nobody around me was catching any fish and uh, I put an indicator on as a sort of last resort and it was phenomenal. Just finish that off. And then of course you would come in with uh, a dab of varnish or a dab of super glue just to make sure it doesn't fall to bits. And there we go. So is there any questions about the bung you would like me to answer before I go? And keep it clean. How would you attach your bung? Would it be on a dropper set up? with a team of flies. Well, Joe, I hope if, if you missed the slideshow before there, or maybe um, you asked a question before I went to the slideshow, so apologies, but I, I've done a slideshow. It's maybe a few minutes back that you, you might want to check out, pal. Do you ever fish the bung on a sliding dropper, Lindsay? You know, I, I do on the still waters, but I don't on the rivers. I, I don't know why. I don't like them sliding bungs on the rivers. I'd rather fish uh, dual. I just um, prefer it. You know what, Black? For somebody sent me a big bag of mop, and uh, I've not tied anything with it yet. But uh, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. You know, I'm, I'm uh, a live and let live sort of guy. If it, if if it works, great. I'll tie a few more. Um, Gordon, I haven't done a video on the bung. Uh, I'll just stick that back in so you can have a good look at it. And, and, and the reason for that is it's quite a long process. So basically what you do is you, you get a chunk of foam and you cut it into a little square and then you shape it with a pair of scissors. Once you've shaped it with scissors, I stick it on a bodkin needle and I give it a little, sh I show it some flame just to seal up that ball. Then I cut a slit in it and super glue it to a hook and I leave that to dry for a long time and then I use a high-vis pen to colour it and then I, s I seal it with some Sally Hansen van varnish sorry I'll say that again without chewing my thumb I seal it with some ha <laughs> I seal it with some Sally Hansen varnish and then I wait for that to dry. Once that's dry, I put on the eyes and then I give it another coat of Sally Hansen. And then once that's dry, I come in with a needle and thread and I thread through a little bit of marabou to create this tail. I, I hope that um, is enough information for you, Gordon, that you can, you can tie your own. I'm too cheap to use a tungsten bead. I just roll some soldering wire flat and wind that. Christ, I thought I was cheap, Chris, but come on, it's one tungsten bead. Hi, Rhys. Um, one fly to fish under a bung during spring on a small still water, it'd be a buzzer, uh, a black buzzer. I don't think there's much more effective than that in the spring. Um, does the size of your bung matter? Mm, I, well, I think you've got to be able to see it for a kickoff, and uh, it's got to be compliant with the fishery rules. That's the one thing I would check. Um, Malcolm, more than anything else, is check that if if you're allowed to fish with more than one fly. If not, then 
you know you need to you you need to be using the uh, the slide on indicators or a, a different type of indicator that doesn't have a hook in it. Did Mark Miles use many blobs or standard sizes? I think he was using a size 12, Eric, but um, I'm not sure. I think a size 12. What rod line presumes seven weight any circumstances for going EG five weight? For the bung, uh, no, a seven a seven weight pole for the small still waters and the large still waters alike. Uh, they're actually latex eyes that are on the fly. Um, I bought them for some predator flies that I've been working on, but uh, I've been too ashamed to show, so uh, I just thought I'd stick them on this one for the video. You haven't tried putting the bung in the oven to seal it. I haven't, Mark, and, I, and I've seen the videos of the boys doing the booby eyes. Um, you know, they, they put them in a, tr a tin foil tray, throw them in the oven for 30 seconds, but... Uh, my oven's no very good, I think it'd probably melt them into just a squidgy mess. So I'll just stick to the, the lighter flame. Pete, um, it, give it a go mate, it, you can try it. If you catch a load of fish, you might think, oh this is for me. And if you don't catch a load of fish, you might think, ah this is a load of rubbish, I'm not going to bother. And uh, why are you not allowed to fish more than one fly? Uh, I, I think that's just the fishery rules. Um, it, the, the two fisheries I frequent the most, Gordon, oh sorry, it's Blackford, the, the, the two fisheries I frequent the most are Albury Estates and Manningford Trout Fisheries, and they're catch and kill fisheries. Um, they're very well stocked, and you know, you, you're absolutely fishing for hundreds of fish. So uh, I think their worry is that you may catch two fish, which would smash your leader, and then you're leaving a fly in a fish, which is... Um, is not good management really, but I, I think that's the reason. I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, if you speak to any of the two fishery managers, they'd be more than happy to explain why that's a rule. Hi, Mark, 160 for two minutes. Oh, the oven, right, yeah, <laughs> you had me confused there. <laughs> yeah, two minutes in the oven at 160. You know what, I, I might give it a go, but I t because I don't tie commercially and I tie for myself, I tend to, um, you know, do five or six at a time, and it's just part of the process for me. And um, maybe if I was tying hundreds, if I was selling them, I might do that. But it, it, thanks very much for the settings, Mark. I appreciate that. Listen, guys, it looks like we're all done. Um, the rugby's on this afternoon. Sadly, I'm going to be missing it because I've stupidly booked my COVID injection for uh, the same time as the rugby. And it's not even like just the first half, it's right in the middle. So my appointment's 20 past three, I'm going to miss the bulk of it. I need to listen to it on the radio, but I'm sure Scotland's going to do very well as always. Listen guys, thanks very much for um, tuning in. It, it, it was a lot more civil than I was expecting and um, I appreciate that because at the end of the day, we're all anglers together and it's just a matter of perspective and just to emphasize that point I had a slide especially for Sunday that was going to give me a ragging and it's this <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it folks I'll see you all again soon bye now